All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the CX Chronicles podcast. Uh, super excited. Brandon DeFore is joining us today. Uh, Brandon is the CEO of The Next Street. And Brandon, I'm pumped to have you on the show today, man, talking about all the cool things that you guys are doing over there. Yeah, man. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks so much for doing this and spreading the CX love across the universe. Hey, it's what's awesome, guys, is the first uh, the first time that Brandon and I chatted, you could tell that there was two, uh, two very eager customer-focused business leaders ready to share ideas, talk shop. Uh, Brandon's got an awesome story. Um, he's building a super cool company, um, and he's here to tell us all about it today. So, Brandon, why don't you start off, man? Take the first couple minutes, set the stage, let the listener, uh, give the listener an idea for, number one, how'd you get to where you are today with your business? And then I'd love for you to spend a couple of minutes in your intro kind of talking about this, how you and I connect, man, which is you build customer centricity in from day one, man. So go ahead and set the stage for, for the listeners. Cool. So origin story goes something like this. Um, I had moved back to Connecticut from New York City in my early 20s um, to help out with our family business, which is a transportation company. Um, at the same time that I had moved back, the largest driving school in Connecticut's owners had gotten in a bunch of trouble. Um, and they basically had to sell their driving school hmm. because of our connections to the transportation industry. We got a phone call from um, the regulators that were, you know, basically prosecuting these owners. And they were like, look, we have no one to take on this customer base. We have no recourse to give anybody in their system refunds. You guys have a good reputation. Would you have any interest in coming in and trying to solve this problem? Um, so we bought the assets of this dying company and dying brand for um, you know pennies on the dollar, basically. And we went to work knowing nothing about driver's ed or driving <laughs> school. It was just an opportunity, um, it seemed like. And our, our general business philosophy was do right by your customers, do right by your staff, and the rest will pretty much sort itself Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I am a broadcast journalism and communications major with no formal entrepreneurship training. And so it was fire by storm. I went to Barnes and Noble and I bought every book in the business section and just started reading those books. Like, you know, entrepreneurship stories from Phil Knight. I love Shoe Dog. Oh, yeah. Yep. By, um, Howard Schultz and the Starbucks story, the Google story, um, every book that Jim Collins wrote, every book that I could basically get my hands on and just filled my mind with that knowledge. And then real time was applying it back into the company. Um, and really approached it with, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, yep. but we're going to experiment with a whole bunch of kind of bullets before we shoot cannonballs. And then as things work, we'll just keep building. So year one, our business did about a million dollars in revenue. We doubled in year two. We doubled again in year three. Um, and it got to this place all of a sudden where it was, you know, uh, went from being a 10 or 12 employee company where I knew everyone and it was super gritty entrepreneurial, like you were the janitor and the CEO and yep. the customer service rep. And I was the driving instructor <laughs> to all of a sudden I, there were people that would walk by in the office and I wouldn't know who they were. You and know? Like, oh, yeah. they, you know, they work in such and such a role. And yep. so I felt like I was losing grip with it a little bit. Um, and it was super cool that the company was growing and I felt it was a major part of my identity. Um, and I remember my son, uh, my first son was born in um, June of 2015. And before my wife went back to work after her maternity leave, we went on a, a baby, like a, a trip as a family, just to like pre her going back to work. Yep. So my son's four months old, it's October, 2015. And we took a flight. And I remember having this feeling at the time of, I had felt like it was kind of a shell of a company. Like there wasn't a lot of substance to it anymore that I had lost track of kind of the values and what we stood for. And it started to feel like, it was just trying to produce money and, and put money to the bottom line. And we landed at the airport in Fort Myers, um, Florida. And I took out my iPhone and there was a cease and desist letter from a driving school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wow. And basically we had named the company the same name as this, um, this driving school in Michigan. And they were laying claim to their name, rightfully so. And they basically told us that we had 90 days to rebrand again, right? <laughs> we did it the first time when we took over the, the dying company. We yeah. didn't do it 
well. Now we're being sued for trademark infringement. We have 90 days to rebrand again. And on the 91st day, their plan was to open in our marketplace and take all of that brand equity on the premise that people wouldn't understand that we, we rebranded and switched. Um, so that was the real turning point for me in my, my leadership, my CEO role, um, and really understanding what service excellence is and how it could differentiate. So we went through a formal rebranding process. And through that process, we really had to decide what we were going to stand for, who we were going to be as a company. And I think what I learned in that process is the, the name of the company and the colors that you pick, yep. they matter a little bit. But the thing that really matters is the story that you build around that. Like, who are you and what do you stand for? So when you think of the best brands in the world, Apple is a piece of fruit until Apple makes it Apple, right? Google is a misspelled math term until Google makes it Google. Nike is a Greek god until Nike makes it Nike. And so the process that we went through was like, where do we stand in the, the driver's education space? And what do we really want to stand for? And at the time in 2015, we were looking way off in the future and acknowledging that at some point, someone's going to invent a car that flies itself. Yep. And so driver's ed is a thing now, but we fully recognize that it's not always going to be a thing. And so we acknowledge that what we're really good at is taking somebody that doesn't know how to do a thing and graduating them months later, knowing how to do that thing. And yep. so we, we looked really at driver's ed as one product line and said, we're building an education company here. The thing that yep. we're working on is an education company. We're a driving school today, but in the future, we may be able to expand into other education lines where we can take somebody that doesn't know a thing and teach them that thing over a period of time. So all of that gets us to, okay, well, where, how do you make a unique splash in the space? And what we found in the driving school space specifically is that every driving school in the country was screaming the same message, which was curriculum safety, curriculum safety, curriculum safety. If you come to our driving school, your teen will be a safe driver. Yep. And what we found on the other end of the phone were customers that were going, how do I do this? How much does this cost? Do I get an insurance discount? And how fast can I finish? There was never a question around curriculum (laughs) ever. And so we were completely misaligned with what our customers valued. And we were in this bullhorn contest with every other driving school as to who could yell it the loudest. And it was like, okay, well, who, who's willing to pay Google and Facebook more to say the safety message. So we really aligned our brand around was outstanding service. We wrote our purpose, make it easy to get a license by providing outstanding service. And that became the foundation that we built the rest of the company around. Um, And then we went through lengthy and continue to today, six years later, lengthy customer experience touch points analysis of, okay, let's not just say that we're an outstanding service provider, but let's go through every little nook and cranny of this company and look for opportunities to provide outstanding service. Um, And it took, I'll say it took three years. Some of my staff might argue, but I'll say it took three years to make that something that wasn't happening because we were standing over people's shoulder and telling them that it was the right thing to do, but it became ingrained in the fabric of the company and the culture of the company. And so now when we bring on new staff members from, from the rip from day one, they are being immersed in outstanding service language. They're being immersed in service training. They understand that it's the norm, the conversations in the parking lot, um, you know, are now on zoom in, in COVID era remotely are no longer like the gossip wheel, you know, the, the, what's the company doing? What are you yeah. doing? Like, how do we get around our bosses? And it really turned into who are your customers? How can we serve them in a more meaningful way? How can I help you? How can you help me? And so it's been really heartwarming. We rebranded in 2016. Um, so it's been five years. And in that five year period, our business has grown 125%. Um, you know, it's, continuing to grow at about 25% a year. And all of that is word of mouth growth because of the service uh, mechanisms that we put in place. Um, sorry about that. Uh, um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're off to the races, man. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing grind um, of trying to figure out how to do meaningful work. And um, 
you know, you're only as good as, as your last at bat. So we, we never rest on our laurels and say, wow, we've built this cool thing. Let's just watch it tick. We're always looking for the next opportunity um, to, to be outstanding because the thing that we do today that's outstanding tomorrow is the, the expectation. And so it's how do we keep taking those next steps and keep providing these new levels of outstanding service so we can surprise and delight our customers. And it's hard work, but it's work worth doing. That's awesome. Well, so number one, Brandon, thank you for sharing all that. That's an awesome, awesome way to set the stage. Awesome way to give the listeners an idea of sort of what you've been going through, what the team's been going through, but also, um, you know, a lot of folks who are listening to this show. We're the people that are literally tasked with having to deal with the customer every single solitary day, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, it's refreshing to hear number one, because the thing that I think most CXers, most customer focused business leaders, they already get it. Um, your comment about from the CEO to the janitor, I hate to say it, but it is as simple as that. Meaning if you're in a company where from the very top of the business to the very bottom of the most junior or the most, the most entry level position, if you don't have customer centricity baked inside of every one of those roles, put inside of the playbooks, put inside of the training, put inside of the onboarding, the language, you mentioned the language piece too. This is huge. I, I think, I hate to say it, but there's some incredible companies out there that financially perform and they kick ass that don't spend any time or any investments or any energy in getting people to understand how to talk to the customer, what types of things to say, not just branding either. I'm talking about like the empathy piece and the, you know, really killing it with working with your customers, about the, the personalization, the human touch, especially now, man, the, me and you were joking about it before the show, like the last 12 months specifically, like companies that are going out of their way to think about that stuff or to do the human touch, they're going to be companies that are, are, are killing it into the future. And they're just going to take over, um, you know, swaths of market space in, in their own, in their own area. So I think that that's an awesome way of setting it. Um, I'd love to jump into the four CX pillars with you, sir. Why don't you spend a couple of minutes telling us about the team that you've been building um, and give us a sense for how you sort of lay your players out on the pitch. Yeah, cool. So I am going to do that, but to just to piggyback on what you just said, I, I think I want to acknowledge that the listeners of your show are CX experts, right? Like the people that aren't thinking about this aren't Googling you or looking for, so the people that are in this are, are already in it. And I think the big turning point for us was the recognition that customer service, customer experience, and brand are all three very different things that on a Venn diagram can wrap around each other, right? Totally. So yep. Brand totally associates with customer experience, but brand is not the customer experience, right? And right. customer service totally associates with brand and customer experience. Customer service is not customer experience. And so for us thinking about those three things um, in interrelated silos has been important. And so now we actually have people that are devoted to each of those three roles and they are regularly collaborating. How do we get our brand to incorporate what we do from a customer experience standpoint? How do we get our customer service representatives and the people that are serving the customers to do it in an experiential way that we've designed and been thoughtful about? But those three roles are three very different roles. Yep. That's important. Yep. Just, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay, cool. Now, team, that's what we're talking about? Yes, sir. Um, from a customer service standpoint, the most important thing that I've learned is that the customer is not always the only customer. So our HR department is providing customer service to our employees. The, the janitorial, the facilities department is providing customer service to our instructors that use those facilities and those cars. Um, the, the IT department is providing customer service to our staff that needs IT help. So we incorporate customer service by asking every role, who is the customer that you serve? Because the answer is not always the customer that's paying us for our service. A lot of times the, the person you're serving is actually other staff members or other teams. Absolutely. Team Internal and external customers. Financial, yep. right? And so defining that has made it so that customer service is really existing in every element of our company. And so by doing that, we can now incorporate those questions into the hiring process. So formerly, 
we would ask customer service questions to our frontline staff, our call center representatives, our driving instructors. Obviously, you need those people to be customer service focused. But when it came to a finance position, we were asking all about the tactical skills of finance. Yep. We flipped that on its head and started really asking service related questions to our finance um, applicants and to our human resources applicants and to our technology applicants that weren't customer facing, but we still wanted them to be customer service minded. That was a big turning point for us in building our team. Um, because it stopped being these pockets of conversations about customer service and started being, oh, this is the fabric of yeah. the organization. Yep. So by having our HR department, we call it our people department, um, by having them focused also on customer service, you're seeing that baked into the application process now where we're going, oh, these applicants are our customers. So we're going to treat them with outstanding customer service from the time they fill out their application. And all of a sudden, we are starting to get this feedback loop from our applicants that were like, I want to work here because of how amazing you're treating me through this process. Yep. Oh, so it's working. And then on day one, it's already baked into the expectation that if I'm going to come to work here, I have to be service minded. I have to know sure. who my customer is and, and how to serve them. So yep. um, I think that's probably the best piece of advice that I can give beyond what you're going to hear from everybody. Like ask the right interview questions, obviously. Yeah, um, right. Don't, don't hire, what is it? Fire, fire fast and hire slow. Yeah. yeah right. right. Um, hire only talented people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Thanks for that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. What do I do when I have to hire somebody fast? No talented people are showing up and I still want to run this culture um, service culture business. That's the hard um, stuff that there aren't easy answers to, but we just, so we, a really tactical example, um, our customer service manager, our call center manager left about seven months ago. She got a, a better job opportunity with bigger pay and bigger benefits and she deserved it. She, she, we didn't have any upward mobility for her and she went somewhere else. Awesome. We just filled that role last week. Wow. And so we left it empty for seven months because yeah. the right applicant didn't show up to the door and it sucked. It was, it really sucked. Like it was, it was a strain specifically on the director in the customer service department, but across the company, we felt that strain. Yep. Um, but that strain was way better than the wrong hire. And, and that's Absolutely. something we've learned. So it's painful, but if you want to put your money where your mouth is and really show that you take this seriously, that's the kind of stuff that the whole company, whether you know it or not, is paying attention to. Yep. Uh, and now yep. the hire that we brought on is amazing. And everybody can look at that and go, oh, they were that's why. They were that's why. Reason. Yep. Yeah. You got to wait for good things, brother. You got to wait for good things to come. You know, a couple, couple, couple points that you just called out, Brandon, that I want to follow up on. Number one, I was literally just having this conversation with one of our clients this morning, but like, a lot of companies out there, specifically startups, scale-ups, companies that are focused on high growth, um, maybe it's happening in a short period of time. The minute that you start thinking about your talent or your people pipeline, the exact same way that you think about your customer or your sales pipeline, and you think about every step, every nook, every cranny, every conversion point, every experience point, what do the journey analytics look like on that? People are going to feel that. And now here's another thing. I'm just going to double up on this. Companies that understand that happy employees equal even happier customers, there's a bit of operational smoothing that is literally happening from the point of the next guy or gal that Brandon needs to bring into next street to the next several students that those people are going to serve for you, right? And this is one of those things, man, where it sounds so easy and it sounds so simple. And it's like, yeah, well, duh, like, but companies don't do it. Even excellent companies don't do it. And, and it's one of these easy things that, you know, folks listening, you can literally start this tomorrow. You can literally sit in the you can sit in the conference room if you're physical, or you can sit on the Zoom Zoom calls if you're remote, and just plot this stuff out, map it out. Ask the last five people that you were trying to hire for your business what they loved about you, what they thought was okay, and what they hated about you, and tell them to be super candid. Even if you haven't hired them ever, they probably won't give you honest feedback then. But or take your last five hires and seriously give them the ability to rip through the weeds and rip the process apart. And and you don't have to take everything and do something with it. But it just gives you those building blocks. It gives you those stepping stones. And it typically leads to next month's goals or next month's priorities. And it, they creep their way in there. But that's how this evolution happens. 
only if you're a good open-minded leader. If you have those conversations with people and they tell you candidly all of the things that you could do to improve and you poo-poo them and you, you yep. find all the reasons that your employee is wrong yep. and you, you like try and convince them that you're right, it'll fail. It'll go the other direction and fail miserably. If you ask for feedback and then you don't use it, watch your happiness scores drop. Um, super tactical. If you have budget, if you're listening and you have budget, there's a system out there called Tiny Pulse that we use. I'm a big promoter of it. Um, it asks our employees every month on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you at work? It's yep. an anonymous survey. Um, so the employees answer and then they give feedback and there's no way to connect it back to who Love that it. employee yep. is. It's completely anonymous. When we started asking five years ago that question and our first happiness score was the most like painful thing to, <laughs> we're so excited to send this out. Like we're going to win awards and we're going to win accolades. Right, right. And then it came back and it was like four and everybody was like, your benefits suck. The pay sucks. You know, <laughs> leadership doesn't understand what we have to deal with out in the field. And no one gives us the resources we need. And we were like, holy shit. Like, yeah, yeah. We were doing such a good job and we're not, but we listened. And every month we took as many of those things as we could. It was like standing in a, a forest of trees and just swinging <laughs> axes. And we started like, knocking down problems. And over the next year, we watched that happiness score creep up and creep up and creep up. And then we won the happiest company in the country award. And as we did, our net promoter score was moving in direct yep. parallel to the, to the happiness score. Yep. Uh, and then the next step that we took, which we're still going through now, um, which I think is, is making us unique and, and an even better place to work, is we started asking, how happy are you outside of work? Okay. And when we first did that, there was this major delta where we were getting nines for people of happiness inside of work, but we were getting threes of happiness outside of work. And the commentary was, were things like, I come to work to escape my home life. I have an abusive boyfriend. My mom is a drug addict. I have elderly parents that I'm caring for and it's exhausting. I don't have the childcare resources that I need and I worry about my children when I'm at work. And there were all of these like pain points and now as a company, we're trying to provide as much resource as possible to give people an out of work foundation to stand on, kind of on the premise that if you're, if you're not coming to work, like able to exhale and, and like be smiling in your totally. home, yeah. you're carrying, carrying that with you. None of this can be justified on a PL. Yeah. Like, you know, when, when the, the employee assistance program invoice comes and we spend 10 grand on an EAP so that our employees have an 800 number they can call for mental health, um, for elderly care, for child care at no cost to them. You can't justify that to a finance department. You can't yep. say, here's the direct return on investment that we're going to get for this investment. But the indirect ROI is worth it 100% of the time. And I think that's the main conflict that CX professionals that I talk to in, in big corporations and bigger companies are having that battle all the time. Yep. Where yep. They've been hired by somebody and tasked with CX, but then the finance, the CFO or the CEO that aren't completely bought into CX are going, why are we spending money? Yeah, why are we spending the money on it? Yeah. Um, and so that, that's, that's a tough battle to fight if you don't have buy-in from leadership across the company. And I think your maybe only option is to either convince your leadership to change or, or move on to a company. That's right. That's, that's exactly that. right. Yep. No. So Brandon, these, these are all awesome, awesome points, man. I, I, we could go on, we could go on deep and deep onto this, but I want to ask you, spend a couple of minutes talking about, you've already hit on this too. Talk to us about process. So as the business grew, as the business scaled, as you had to bring on more drivers, as you had more students coming on board, I imagine that the, the headquarters staff, same thing, blew up. You have all these different people that are coming with all this new experience. They've got all these ideas. They've done things before. They're Spend some time talking about what it's looked like over the last six years or so, as you guys have had to evolve the process or evolve the playbook or evolve the, the, the operating procedures that's allowed this growth to have some basic guardrails, but also for the team to actually know what's expected of them and what they need to do for their given role or for their given uh, area of responsibility. I'm, I'm snickering. Um, I'm snickering because of how hard this is. So <laughs> it's not, a, Hey, it's not an easy one, man. It's not an easy one at all. <laughs> no. And here's, here's my way of generally solving for this problem. Tool it. 
right? Go base camp and Slack and G drive. And we're going to get all, we're going to get a knowledge base and we're going to get an intranet and we're going to get HubSpot and we're going to automate it. And we're going to get chat bots. And we're going to just like keep adding technology layers to this. And then, you know, what inevitably happens with each of those is like, we pay for them and then months go by and people don't use them anymore. And the it's the lack of utilization. Yeah. All in through yeah. the um, So what I've learned um, in the, the six years is number one, to document everything yep. and bake that into the culture of the company. So um, it's something we're still working on now across our leadership team where it's like, you can't just make on the fly changes anymore. We're at a company size now where the change that you make in Greenwich, Connecticut will cause ripples in Providence, Rhode Island if that change isn't appropriately communicated. Absolutely. Change management, it's a, it's a science. That's why some of these big so, huge companies, they have to have it th thought about. Yeah, and if I stood here today and said I had the answers, I'd, I'd be lying to you. It's, it's something that we're constantly working on of how documenting the process is step one. Training on that process is step two, but then maintaining that process um, as the company grows and develops and as things change and then retraining on those changes is step three and four. And, and those are often the hardest steps where it's, you know, you go back to something that you wrote three years ago, you haven't looked at since yeah, right, you find right. out the frontline employees are looking at it every day and it's not right. And you're yeah. like, Oh, that's yeah. causing problems. That, absolutely. It's where feedback loops are so important. That service that I mentioned, Tiny Pulse, um, for employee facing, we use Delighted for customer facing. And that way, if there's anything that's at least causing like real service ripples or real culture ripples, it bubbles up pretty quickly. People will say like, this isn't working and we can attack the process. Um, but anyway, the process is so important. Um, I'm a firm believer in hiring people with brains and hearts and then empowering them to use those brains and hearts. So it's a delicate balancing act between creating process that empowers your employees to make the right decisions out in the field and over processing people where the checklist becomes more important than what you're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, and so for us, it's making sure that our culture is one where you don't have to raise your hand and ask for permission, solve whatever yeah. problem is facing you. And then let's have a postmortem on why those things came up and what could have been done differently, better, et cetera, in the yep. future. And then yep. document that in a go forward way. Um, so I don't know, we're figuring it out. I'm right now in the, we use HubSpot for our knowledge base provider. Um, we've eliminated all of the other tools because they were expensive and nobody was using them. We're using the HubSpot knowledge base and we're right now having conversations around this knowledge base is only as good as people's ability to use it. So do Absolutely. we layer, do we layer a chat bot on top of this or how do we really support people in a meaningful way beyond just writing the answers down? and hoping that they find them. Yeah, those having those those playbooks for success and understanding not only where to find the place, but how to run the place, how to execute the plays, and then to be able to rinse, wash, and repeat on it. So again and again and again, so whether it's customer one or customer 1001, that consistency gets baked in there too, Brent. So you've, you've, you, you, you nailed it on, on the process piece and the tools piece. That's awesome. And thank you for sharing that, by the way. And the second piece is just like, you're right, man. These businesses today, you said it at the front of this call, they evolve so quickly and they evolve so rapidly. And frankly, frankly, most businesses, especially startups and scallops and growth focused companies, they take the feedback and they literally change tomorrow's service and tomorrow's sales and tomorrow's expectations with it. And that's one of the big reasons why you're going to see some of the growth that you talked about earlier at the front of the show. But also, again, it's, it's, I, I hate to keep going. This is funny because we keep going back to the employee side in this in this episode, but those are fun businesses to be a part of. Those are fun businesses to show up to work at. Those are fun businesses to feel like you've got freedom and autonomy to go up to a brand and say, hey, man, I know I've only been driving for you for six months, but dude, I, I've heard these last 10 things and I keep hearing them every single time I'm riding with students. Can I pick your brain for 15 minutes? And having that comfort, that comfortability or being in a work environment, an organization 
where that stuff's like pushed, you're, you're like, it's like, come on, bring that stuff. That's what we're here for. That's how we're going to get better. Dude, that's just a fun place to work. Yeah, for sure. And when you can talk about process, when you can process that, when you can bake that kind of culture into your systems so that it doesn't happen because, you know, you have a free half hour on a Tuesday and you decide to start randomly calling people, but it happens <laughs> because every Friday from one to two, you have an open Zoom room and you invite all employees into that open Zoom room to share it with you. Um, it happens because, you know, you have a real system um, of error logging and then addressing those error logs with some kind of a, a committee within your company, make it baked into what you do and put your habits and routines in a place that it's an ongoing thing that's yep. happening within the walls of your company. Um, watch that start to ripple into other departments and into other places within the company. Because when, when the CEO is doing it or when a somebody C-suite is doing it, other people take notice. And in large companies, when you do it, your department will start to be successful and other department heads will go, what's he doing? Right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. What company. are they up to over in that department? Yeah. Why is that department getting all the accolades and the CEO's weekly email and you, people will start, it'll just start to ripple. So um, yeah, I think absolutely it, it matters. Love it. Um, you, you talked about uh, Timmy Pulse, you talked about feedback. I want to pick your brain a little bit further on feedback. Um, look, a lot of business owners are, I mean, they wake up every morning trying to figure out how to put up some of the growth, some of the growth numbers that you, that you shouted out. Can you, can you give the listeners just a few more ideas around early on, you guys must've been taking every piece of student feedback and, and, and like we just talked about converting it on the spot so that like, maybe even in the next touch point with that customer. Hey, hey, by the way, we heard what you said over here and we just did these three things. Can you spend a little bit of time, like as the company grew and as you had more and more students, you had more and more drivers, how did you manage the mounting volume of feedback to be able to keep, like, cause you mentioned at the front of the show, when we had 12 people, I knew everybody I was serving people coffee and now it's a different ball game, right? You're, you're about to have hundreds of people in the business. What did that look like? How did you guys evolve with being able to take that mounting or, or that rising volume um, and still keep up that 12 person type of, 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 of thing going on where it still feels tribal and it still feels small and, and organic? It's inflection points, I think. So, you know, we had a major inflection point when we went from a million dollars in revenue to $2 million in revenue, where it was like, okay, I can't lead this thing by myself anymore. I need more leaders. Yeah. Um, and then I think the next major inflection point was in that four to $5 million um, revenue range where it was like, okay, we don't just need manager level people anymore. We need a, a higher caliber business mind to be able to, to handle those things. And as we added, you know, org chart layers and we added complexity, we just made sure that we were baking in process to handle that level of, of complexity. So example, like very specific example, we have committees um, that are tasked with handling that feedback. Okay. Um, so Delighted comes in, um, we've automated Delighted so that it gets bucketed based on um, who reports to who. Awesome. And then the managers as part of their job description are taking that feedback and working directly with those employees um, to improve the customer experience. And then we actually have a bubble up process. So we have a monthly leadership team meeting devoted to just customer feedback where we sit for an hour and we take the most kind of impactful um, pieces of customer feedback. And we talk yep. about systems changes that need to be made to, to affect the customer experience across the company. Um, so I think it's a, it come, it's everything that we've just talked about, hire the right people, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, make sure that, that customer service is baked into their job descriptions and then give them the tools and resources that they need to be successful in those jobs. It feels super like, undergraduate business class to say those three things. Um, but sometimes you hear them from a different voice and you're able to apply them. I totally agree, man. And they're spot on too, by the way, they're spot on for any business in any industry. So here's the other thing I'll say that, that got brought up, which I think about a lot, our growth, like in the entrepreneurship circles that, that we run in growth numbers are talked about like Super Bowl wins, right? Yep. Like yep. I, I've got this much or we're a unicorn or we've grown to these levels. 
And it's like, okay, cool. What impact are you having? Because I know, and I'm, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure all the callers on this or all the listeners on this know, um, people that have sold their business for insert number here, right? I got a $50 million exit. I had a $100 million liquidity event and, and they're set. And it's like, cool, you're 38. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> now what, right? And yeah. um, a, a close friend of mine, AJ Wasserstein, is a, an MBA professor at Yale. And he did a study on this of people that exited their companies for 50 million bucks before their 50th birthday. And a large percentage of them are miserable. And so I, I don't know, for, for the young entrepreneurs that are on the grind, I think for me, profitability is a cool metric. Growth is a cool metric. But I try to never lose sight of like the happiness quotient, yep. uh, you know, the, the impact level, the, the purpose driven question of why are we why are we getting up and doing this every day? Yep. Because the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is, from my experience with people, is one of the most deflating and debilitating moments of your life where it's like, oh, <laughs> now what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that speaks directly to, to CX and customer experience because that re to do it well, you have to have real clarity on why you get up and get out of bed in the morning. Like to, to really connect to your customers in a meaningful way, you have to care about what they care about. And so yep. for us, we're dealing with 16 year old kids that are getting their driver's license. And if for us, it was just a, a factory of getting kids their license, cool, we'll put a new back deck on the house. But when we were really able to go, remember the day that you got your license, like remember that feeling of being a 16 year old kid walking into the DMV, the nerves, like the, yep. the the, I hope I don't get that agent. I know he's the hard agent, or I hope right, I don't make right. it parallel park. I don't really have it down. And then you go through the test and the, like the moment that he checks the pass button and you have that, holy shit, like yep. I'm free. Like I am free from my parents' umbrella. I can drive myself wherever. I'm going to go get my girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, and we are going to just drive across the country. And, yeah, yeah. and the world is my oyster. And that connection, like to that kind of joy is what we're, what like drives us and gets us out of bed in the morning is we're celebrating that hundreds of times a day. Yeah. And that's the part that's exciting for us is we're opening a lot of doors for a lot of people. The driver's license isn't just a driver's license. That's your ticket to a job in a lot of yep. cases. That's yep. your ticket like out of your parents' house. That's your ticket to freedom, responsibility, independence, all of those things. And it's that connection to the greater purpose that like the profit is still really cool. The money's fun. The back deck reconstruction is cool. It is still cool. All of that's taken away. We still know that we had major impact on 25,000 teen drivers a year. And that part's cooler. That's awesome, man. Well, look, Brandon, as we wrap up today's show, man, first of all, this is awesome. You gave us a ton of different ideas to think about. Um, thank you so much for sharing the story. Um, as we wrap up, where can people find out more about you, sir? And then where can people find out more about The Next Street? Yeah, cool. My uh, personal blog and website is brandondufour.com. Um, the Next Street is just thenextstreet.com. If anybody um, is in the New England area, we are rapidly hiring. We have about 100 job openings around our company right now. Um, we're growing quickly um, and would love to, to see your applications in. So that's just the nextstreet.com backslash careers. We are all over social, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, Snapchat. I think we're on them all now, YouTube. The whole nine. Uh, yeah. I mean, our customers are 16 year old kids. So you got to be there. You got to be all over there. Fish where the fishes are. <laughs> I still pretend to understand it. I don't, you know, uh, in my day, we played video games. I always feel so old. Like, yeah. oh yeah watching my buddy on Twitch the other day. I was like, cool. You didn't want to just go over to his house and like, just play. go play the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, awesome. So I'm, I'm officially old. Uh, but yeah, we're on all of them. So um, would love to hear from people. And I love talking about this. I love talking about business growth, business leadership, customer experience, um, ways to, to create impactful businesses and to really affect company culture in a meaningful way. Um, so here's my challenge to, to business leaders that, that I've been really thinking about a lot lately is, you know, the, the problems, the global problems that we hear all the time are global and they're huge and they're scary. And we hear about, you know, um, racism, lack of diversity, um, gender equality, gender identity, 
um, the pandemic, obviously, all of these massive just global hairy issues that when you look at them on a global scale, they can't be solved. But I'm really curious to know what business leaders can do. Business leaders that have proven they're really good at finding a problem, creating a solution for it, monetizing that solution, and then growing a business and system around that solution. What if we applied that same mindset to these macro problems yep. in a micro way within our company's walls? So if you're a, a CX designer, what can you do to design a diversity program within your company? The same way that you would design CX to solve racism within the walls of your company. What kind of things can you do for maternity leave programs that aren't government mandated, but that give women the ability to be successful mothers and successful career people? Yep. What other major macro problems really affect you that you can attack in a micro way within the walls of your company? And maybe if we all do that and we start to get it right, those solutions can scale without the federal government needing to issue a $15 minimum wage mandate. Yeah. Instead, yeah. we pay people appropriately because it's the right thing to do. Uh, so I'll leave, uh, I'll leave your listeners with that challenge. And if anybody wants to debate it with me, hit me. They know where to find you. Brandon Dufour, thank you so much for coming on the CX Chronicles podcast, brother. It's been an absolute pleasure, man. Pleasure's mine. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely.